Okay, we have three minutes after seven o'clock. I want to begin and uh, I'm very, very happy. I'm glad to welcome you all, the participants and the reference at the sixth lecture today at the evening. It is almost the last lecture from the seven that we prepared. I my name is Gerhard Servatius Deppner. I'm living in Romania. I'm a Lutheran pastor and a very new director of the CETO. This is the Centrum für Evangelische Theologie Ost, in English Center of Protestant Theology in Eastern Europe. Um, the Evangelische Bund, Protestant League, works in close cooperation with the Protestant churches in Germany. It promotes theological education and the knowledge of the different Christian denominations, as well as ecumenical understanding. In collaboration with the Communion of Protestant Churches in Europe, GK in German, Gemeinschaft Evangelischer Kirchen in Europa, and the Center in Sibiu, Hermannstadt in Romania, it organizes this conference for young theologians dealing with the tension in Protestant churches between nationalism and cosmopolitanism. The Digital Academy and the Ecumenical Conference are founded by the program Erasmus Plus of the European Union. Therefore, we say thanks a lot for this big fund. Now I would uh, like to uh, ask you to turn off your microphones when you are not speaking, of course, and if possible, please turn your camera on. Thank you. We'd like to see you. And uh, I want to remember the last time on 13th January, we have heard in our fifth lecture, we discussed about models of lived multiculturalism in local congregations. You remember Thorsten Moritz from Church's Commission of Migrants in Europe highlighted the connection between migration and multiculturalism. In the second part of the evening, Anne Zell, pastor in Como, Italy, member of Coordinating Council of the Intercultural Theology course, presented the program Essere Chiesa, Being Church. The church is on the way to living intercultural community. I like very much how Pastora Anetzel ended with the words, it is a never ending journey. So she said, now this evening, our journey is being continuing. Let me show again what we will make today. Please, thanks. The first point is now ending and I will present very short what we will hear and discuss today, the evening about historical continuity, new beginnings, and the formation of Protestant identity. We will finish, it is the plan, our conference today at eight o'clock. It is the middle European time. And I'm very honored, very glad and happy to welcome today three persons, three reference. I want to welcome first Mr. Anton Tikomirov. He is born 1971 in Leningrad, today St. Petersburg, Russia. He studied in St. Petersburg State University, Department of Journalism. Since 92, he is lay preacher in the St. Catherine Lutheran Church in St. Petersburg. He was uh, 1996 ordinated for pastoral ministry. Until 2000, he studies in the Theological Seminary of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Russia. 
and he studied also in Germany at the Friedrich Alexander University in Erlangen. He has made master, PhD, with a doctoral dissertation, Russian translations of German church hymns. And since 2005, he is professor and president of the Theological Seminary of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Russia, El Cross. El Cross is um, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Russia and other states. Also, I want to welcome today Sister Nicole Grochovina. She studied history, ethnology, and Japanese at the University of Hamburg. Her PhD thesis at the University of Hamburg addressed confessional identities in the early modern period. Her habilitation thesis deals with gender issues in civil courts during the 18th century. She works at the Friedrich Alexander University of Erlangen, Nuremberg, history and church history. And in 2008, she entered a Lutheran monastery. Last but not least, Raphael Quandt studied theology in Neuendettelsau, Leipzig, and Erlangen. After, this vicariate, after his vicariate in Nuremberg, he served as a Lutheran pastor in Chile and as a teacher for systematic theology and dogmatics in the Ecumenical Theological University of Santiago de Chile. In continuation, he was a student pastor at the Otto Friedrich University in Bamberg. And since 2018, he is responsible for the ecumenical relationships between the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Bavaria and churches in Eastern Europe. Thank you that you all three are today with us. And just uh, one more, just one um, regie anweisung. We will have two uh, sessions of group discussion in breakout rooms, but we will uh, discuss in plenum just after the second uh, lecture. Take the conclusions after we will go in the groups a little bit later in the plenum after the second lecture. Now, we will hear here, we will hear the first lecture and if there are questions, please uh, say it now. We have a big program today. If it's not any questions, then Mr. Tikomirov, the floor is your Pajalsta. Thank you very much. Of course, I could speak on a given topic from a purely dogmatic or church historical point of view, but it's much more important to expose it from the perspective of my church, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Russia. This is the only way my presentation can, can become authentic. But I'd like to start far away. When I was still a child, I remember how stunned I was by Ray Bradbury's story, Chrysalis. In this story, a completely normal person suddenly becomes totally covered in a strange cocoon and falls into some sort of lethargic state. The scientists who observed him immediately perceived his similarity with a pupa into which a caterpillar changes before becoming a butterfly. They understood what was happening. It was a new stage in human's evolution. In the end, something completely new should appear. It would be a jump forward. They started to dream about what that man would turn into in the end. Would he be unbelievably smart or very strong? 
would he have immunity against all disease? Would all his bad character traits and habits disappear? And then one day it's happened. It happened. The cocoon broke open and the renewed man came into the light. His appearance was no different than before. He wasn't stronger or smarter. His organism didn't have any special immunity. He even kept his smoking habit. The scientists, disappointed, let him go from the laboratory. He calmly left the building and crossed the street. And when the laboratory building was hidden from view around the corner, he threw away his cigarette butt and freely flew into the air. It was so natural. He had gained the capacity to fly. We will return to this story later. For now, I suggest that we fly across the ocean. Better not like a butterfly. It could take too long and our moderator will be angry. Uh, but I'll tell you a story. 1999 was the uh, 200th anniversary of the birth of the great Russian poet, Alexander Pushkin. There were various conferences, exhibitions, and other events. At one point, representatives from the city administration came to my congregation, which is located almost in the center of St. Petersburg, and they asked us to prepare something for this anniversary. At first, we were puzzled. What could a Lutheran German heritage congregation have in common with a great Russian poet. We thought about it for a while, and then we found an, an obvious link. One of the members of our church council at that time, uh, 200 years ago, was Graf von Benkendorf, the head of the Tsarist secret police and the personal persecutor of Pushkin. True, we decided not to talk about that. Uh, this fact is not very pleasant itself. Nevertheless, it shows how much the Lutheran church was integrated into Russian society before the October revolution of 1917, how rich our history is. Today, our church is a small minority in the religious landscape of Russia. According to various estimations, our number ranges from 16 to 50,000 people, while the total population of Russia is about 145 million people. In addition, our believers are scattered over an unimaginable territory. Often, thousands of kilometers can separate one congregation from another. Some of them can be reached only by the air. This is the first obvious feature of the position of our church, an extremely small number of members distributed over an extremely large territory. I never tire of repeating. Our church has its own history, incomparable with the fate of other Lutheran churches, even in Eastern Europe. No other church has, uh, has withstood as many trials over the last century as ours. At the beginning of the 20th century, our church was a state church with the Russian Tsar as its head, as Sumus Episcopus, and had up to 5 million members. At the same time, the total population of Russia was about 170 million. However, in the 20th century, our church suffered three big hits. They seem to have completely disrupted any possible continuity. The first was the October Revolution and subsequent persecution of believers. At the end of the 30s, without exception, all Lutheran church buildings were closed and all pastors were either shot, 
sent into exile or fled the country. The second blow was the beginning of the Second World War and the mass deportation of Russian Germans to Siberia, Kazakhstan, and Central Asia. Not everyone was able to survive in inhuman conditions. Third, and the hardest impact was the opening of borders by the perestroika and the immigration of Russian Germans. About 2 million potential members of our church are now in Germany. And this process proceeded very quickly. It took 10 to 15 years. When our church was reborn by perestroika, we thought about completely different figures than we have today. To these three major blows has to be added the first separation of the Baltic republics from Russia in, in 1918. Almost half of the parishioners lived on their territory and our only educational institution, the Department of Theology of the University of Tartu was located there before the October Revolution. Uh, what I just told you is not just a history. These are processes that affect uh, the current situation or even continue today. Uh, for example, the wave of immigration of the remaining Russian Germans to Germany has not yet ended completely. We, uh, here we need to mention another feature of our situation. Uh, this is a fundamental impossibility to make a convincing decision about what kind of church we want to be. A kind of uh, established church, a Volkskirche, or a free church. These are two fundamentally different approaches to building a church, to completely different ways of thinking, to different self-identities. For centuries, our church has been a strong established or even state church, the church of the Russian Germans and the Baltic peoples. Such the church of Russian Germans, it remains in the minds of many parishioners and partly in public opinion to this day. However, in this way, our church becomes the church of a dying or very small ethnic group a dying culture and a dying, a dying identity, and therefore has practically no chance of survival. A special, more optimistic sort of this attitude is the thesis of my predecessor as rector of our seminary, Godeke von Bremen. Uh, he said that Lutheranism in Russia is a means to be a Christian in the Western way. Uh, let us note that this definition of our identity is very attractive for many new church members. However, the central elements of the Lutheran confession play in this approach a secondary role. The alternative would be to take the path of a free church hold together by its specific doctrine. But with such a small number of members as we have, this path almost inevitably leads to isolation, to fundamentalist self-awareness, to the adoption of miss missionary methods, traditions, and elements of the doctrine from charismatical groups. If one or another Lutheran congregation chooses this path, it would inevitably seek support not in the Lutheran confession, but in the teaching and practices of free evangelical churches. This contributes to the development of the intra-Protestant ecumen, but at the same time to the loss of our own identity. Our dissolution in the general Protestant and neo-Protestant environment. Remarkably is that even relatively uneducated and evangelical pastors and preachers in our church could feel 
this danger. Uh, for example, one of our very conservative pastors told me that every time his brother-in-law, a Baptist, comes to visit his family, he, our pastor, drinks a glass of vodka before dinner. Although otherwise he does not that. So he wants to irritate his guest because Baptists don't drink alcohol. But we must admit a glass of vodka is too weak guarantee for the preservation of Lutheran identity. Uh, the described problems require a theological and dogmatic disclosure. Paul Tillich's thoughts on the Protestant principle seem to me useful in this regard. Uh, in his small article in which he outlines his vision of the basic principles of Protestant religious education at school, uh, some problem des evangelischen Religionsunterricht, Paul Tillich formulates his understanding of the Protestant principle. Uh, let me give you a quotation in German. Es muss vielmehr gezeigt werden, dass die evangelisch verstandene christliche Verkündigung einen radikalen Protest gegen jede kirchlich-konfessionelle Verhärtung ihrer selbst enthält, dass der Protestantismus nicht eine andere Gestalt, sondern ein anderes Prinzip des Religiösen ist, ein Prinzip, das ihn selbst als, als besondere Gestalt fragwürdig macht, ihn dafür aber in Geltung setzt für jede religiöse Gestalt. Another famous German theologian, Paul Althaus, means about the same thing when he talks about the difference between the Evangelical Lutheran Church and the Evangelical Lutheran Confession. Again, a quotation in German. Uh, dass die Wirkung der Reformation so umgrenzt, dass aus der reformatorischen Bewegung lutherische Kirche wurde, konnte und kann dahin führen, dass auch das Selbstverständnis dieser Kirche sich verengt. Man richtet sich in seinem Hause fest ein. Aus dem Boden, der unterwegs ist, wird ein Sesshafter. An der Stelle des diakonisch-ökumenischen Geistes tritt der kirchliche Patriotismus, die Pflege des Ererbten, unseres Typus, die bloße kirchliche Treue, die lutherische Heimatliebe, der Wille, die eigenen besonderen Gaben zu entfalten, der eigenen Art zu leben. Unser aller lutherische Haltung steht immer wieder in der Gefahr, nur lutherischer Patriotismus zu sein. According to Althaus, the Lutheran Church is only one concrete, limited, and imperfect in its concreteness form of Lutheran confession, capable of obscuring and distorting its principle. So we need to distinguish between a Christian and Protestant forms and the Christian and Protestant principle. The forms may be different. They include ethical, church legal norms, dogmatic creeds, liturgical and near liturgical tradition, and so on. Uh, the principle of Christianity and of the Protestantism is exclusively the good news about God's love and God's unconditional acceptance of sinners in Christ. But in the minds of most ordinary believers, it is the forms which are decisive and the only important ones. The boundaries between confessions and even between Christianity and other religions are perceived as the boundaries between various forms of Christian or of uh, religions in general. This is especially true when the Protestant church is an alien environment as is the case in Russia. The Lutheranism as an attempt to live not by form, but by principle fails again and again. 
This is the historical tragedy of Lutheranism and the Protestant church in general. But nevertheless, that is why the existence of Lutheranism and the Protestant church is fundamentally important for the whole of the Christianity as the most loud and institutionalized reminder of a Christian principle. In Russia, we have a rich heritage, but again and again, we need renewal. It's important to understand, however, that this should be a renewal, not only and not so much of church forms, but a perpetual renewal in the spirit of other comment, the dominance of form, renewal in the spirit of the Protestant principle. Only then such a new beginning can be truly fruitful. In Russian society, it's very important. Practicing Christians of any church are a clear minority. Russian is very secular. Our church, occupies an even more insignificant segment of those who consider themselves Lutherans. At first glance, this situation may seem almost hopeless. However, it's possible to look at our situation from an unusual point of view. The main thing that is required for this is the rejection of the arrogant attitude towards the secular or skeptical majority. We need to understand ourselves not as a completely special and unique and therefore staying in a minority church form, but as a kind of enclave of a non-church majority within the Christian minority. We should understand ourselves as ordinary, as normal people, and associate with them. It is we who can share the fears and thoughts of those people who usually do not relate themselves to any church because they find the given church forms unattractive. It is we who can become their voice in the generally conservative and not flexible Christianity of Russia. Such a position to be advocates of the majority among the minority can and should also lead to the opposite effect. It is we who will be able to become advocates of Christianity among the secular majority. If we are owned for ordinary people from the street, then they have the right to criticize society and public opinion from a Christian standpoint. However, the crucial thing here is not to rely on a central, on a certain church form inherited on you, but on the gospel or Protestant principle itself. This is a huge chance and challenge for our church today, remaining today, remaining the minority within minority, becoming a voice that can be heard by most of the Russian society. This is our challenge and this is our chance. And do you remember the main character from the Ray Bradbury story? For me, being a Lutheran in Russia today is not about confessing certain dogmas, not about following certain ethical rules, not about using certain liturgies or holding certain biblical interpretations. It's not about being purer than others morally, nor knowing more than others about the world around us. For me to be a Lutheran, especially in contemporary Russia, means that in us and upon us an ancient, and certain and central dream of humanity has been fulfilled to be accepted by God, forgiven, loved, and free from the law and the curse. A dream as ancient and as rooted in our existence 
as the dream of human flight. We need and we have not continuity as such and not the new beginning as such, but a miracle that happens again and again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ticomiro. And now we will hear directly the second moment. <laughs> okay. Yes, we will uh, take the question from um, Mr. Ticomiro. I will uh, write it in the chat for all. Mr. Tikomirov uh, prepared a question for us. Do you find the distinction between the church form and the Christian Protestant principle relevant for your contemporary church situation? We will discuss in breakout rooms, but without the plenum that I meant. This is the question. If you have now a question to the question, please, Mr. Tikomiro will uh, explain to us. And then we will have 15 minutes, just 15 minutes. I know it's not so much time, but we will be curious and want to speak more after that. Okay, do you have the question written, copied? And no other question from the group? Anna Magdalena Lerch. Yes, I have just this short question of understanding. When you refer to the principle relevant for um, the Protestant church, or you also called it the spirit of Protestant principle, do you mean the um, justificate the teaching of justification or the force or the solis? Or, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, thank you very much. Yeah, yes, I mean, uh, or Paul Tillich means, uh, really the uh, gospel, the good news about justification. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you. And now um, we will will be more groups for some persons. I mean, we are 23 persons now or 22. Um, we can make uh, four person in one group. Uh, and we will have 15 minutes to discuss after the groups directly the second lecture, uh, take the conclusions of the groups a little bit later, have fun and constructive and productive conversations. Now the technique, perfect. Welcome back. I don't know if the other are still discussing, maybe. I hope they are discussing and not uh, leaving us. Oh yeah. Oh, wonderful. Okay, welcome back. I not just hope, I'm sure that you had good discussions and uh, we are very curious to hear about them. But now we will hear the second lecture, historical continuity, new beginnings and the formation of Protestant identity with Sister Grohovina and Mr. Quant. Please, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. I will share a PowerPoint presentation on the screen. So um, it will now appear and I will just get it started. There we are. So historical continuity, new beginnings and formation of Protestant identity. Today, Bavaria, where we come from, Sister Nicole and I, is not only a federal state in the Federal Republic of Germany, but it is also a brand for tourism, culture, certain customs and traditions. The key words for this are quickly mentioned and well known. It's Oktoberfest, Lederhose, Maßkrug, wheat beer, pretzels, Leberkäse, white sausage, and white and blue flags. And of course, you know not only the words, but also the pictures. Taking such a broad look at the cultural situation here in Bavaria, one might jump to the conclusion drawn from Ecclesiastes explaining that there is nothing new under the sun. In fact, the narratives concerning Bavaria, which ad agencies have converted into cash, suggest that once upon a time, Bavaria has been invented, presumably by God himself, and since then has remained the same. One might speak of historical continuity here, lasting right until today, while absorbing all kinds of efforts to set up new beginnings. You may have realized that these passages concerning Bavaria are presented with a twinkle in our eyes, sharpening the point that we like to address the power of narratives that promote the idea of historical continuity by setting up a strong, straightforward master narrative, which intentionally swallows up any other antagonistic views of historical events and any diverse narratives. Stating this leads us to a concise thinking about continuity, identity, new beginnings and diversity. Taking Protestant identity as an example, we will do this now in three steps. First, we need to raise the question whether it is helpful and possible at all to speak of any kind of continuity in history. And secondly, we need to address the question why it is almost impossible to speak of a single identity, even in the parent country of the Reformation. And finally, we will understand that identity always needs to be regarded as time bounded and context oriented. Therefore, we always need to deconstruct contemporary narratives about continuity. From here on, I take over, because we now start with the problem of continuity. As early as the year 1868, the German historian Johann Gustav Dreusen, who might be one of the earliest and most noted researchers to address the problem of continuity in this sense, underlined that speaking about continuity always delivers a specific teleological understanding of history. In fact, Droysen explains history needed a goal and the path to reach this goal was paved by a constant and continual development of humankind. That's his idea. In this way, Droysen suggests there was a movement of humankind in time and there could be progress. However, it was wrong to confuse this diverse progress with history, Droysen states. Instead, History had to be judged as the result, and now I quote Droysen, as a result of empiric perception, experience, and research. So in the end, Droysen has deconstructed the idea of a continual history that in the end would reach some goal in the sense of salvation history. We can state this beside the fact that Droysen proposes that studying history might teach something about the purpose of all purposes, as he puts it, and therefore about God and his essence. This is not an issue of teleolo 
theology, teleology, oh goodness, not or even of theolo theology, rather Dreisen briefly points out that history as such lies in the hand of God, but this did not release the historian from a proper understanding of the narratives he brought up. In fact, Dreisen suggests examining experiences, perceptions, and all human business while acknowledging that historians could work neither with the past nor with the future. In fact, they can only work with questions drawn from their present, since human acts of will and business can only be detected here in the present times. Therefore, by setting up narratives that try to capture historical events in a plausible way, historians make the past present. Consequently, Dreusen concludes that every historian had to be aware of his or her subjective perspective as well as his or her favorite narratives and conceptions of history as a sign of a specific cultural identity which shapes the views and questions. Now, having said this, let us turn to the second aspect and let us ask what insights we can draw from the historiographic debate about continuity if we assign these insights to the issue of a specific Protestant identity. The question asking for our origin and identity, even our confessional identity, appears to be as old as humankind. Moreover, it addresses the desire to explore a continual and evolving identity in order to find casualty and to draw conclusions from it and then understand the present and even the future in an appropriate way. Moreover, if you do not, do not regard history and the development of a single denomination as given by God, you probably conclude that identity as well as history might be an idea set up by humankind and needs to be put into narratives in order to unfold its power. Now, speaking about Protestant identity, we discover a number of narratives which seem to hold their grounds for centuries. Let us have a look at a very telling example. Martin Luther posting his thesis. Every historian goes like, oh, no. We will take this as an example to show how the idea of continuity was connected to political, strategic, and confessional interests. Despite the fact that we cannot confirm that Martin Luther has nailed his thesis to the door at the Church of Wittenberg, this moment of nailing made quite a career in his histor historiography. Here, we can study how narratives serve different interests to set up or to break continuity. Moreover, the unproven posting of the thesis illustrates what we have already understood while examining the ideas of Dreusen. The past comes to life when questions of the present are attributed to it in order to fulfill an interest grounded in the present. Now, the historian Stefan Benz has suggested that the Catholic narrative addressing the incidents of 1517 emphasizes continuity. By stating the power of tradition, which encompasses the Middle Ages and the early modern period, Martin Luther and the Reformation became some kind of accident within history. Nevertheless, Catholic theologians like Franz Moschus, who died in 1613, or Andreas Hosius, who died in 1631, were very positive that Luther's try to renew the structure and the alignment of the church would split on the rock of the church's traditions and history. In other words, the argument of continuity in their sense went along with tradition based on confession, and it was used as a narrative to integrate the issue of the Reformation into a Catholic understanding of history and of the contemporary world. However, Protestant theologians also found their own way of dealing with the issue of continuity. In fact, they also regarded this as a strong argument to consolidate and strengthen their identity and to battle the Catholic narratives. 
The Lutheran theologian Matthias Flatius, who, who lived from 1520 to 1575, for instance, took great effort to set up a model for testis veritatis, constructing some kind of witnesses of the truth who started in ancient times and led directly to Martin Luther and his contemporaries. And Jan Hus, for example, was one of these witnesses. During his lifetime, Luther struggled hard whether he should draw a line between and Jan Hus. But finally, he, Luther, stated that Jan Hus and him were closely connected. The Catholic Church, Luther argued, persecuted both of them. However, Hus writing De Ecclesia about the church contained an understanding of church which Luther could accept at least to some extent. Lutheran historiography was less scrupled by this constructed continuity. In fact, it heavily exploited Luther's statement from 1531 that Jan Hus, when he was sentenced to the stake, might have shouted out, and I, and I quote the historiographic view, I quote, they will roast they will roast a goose, which is the translation of um, Hus. They will roast a goose. However, a hundred years later, they will hear a swan singing, and this swan will remain. Of course, Martin Luther had attributed the swan to himself. However, the problem Lutheran historiography had to face was that the list of persuasive testis veritatis was not very long. Moreover, some of the witnesses that were digged up looked pretty heretic as well, even in Lutheran eyes. Therefore, the problems Flatius had to face while publishing his centuries between 1559 and 1574 at Magdeburg was that he wanted to set up the narrative of continuity, but he obviously had underestimated the challenges that went along with this project. Now, apart from pulling up a list of testes veritatis, Lutheran historiography took further step to establish a narrative of continuity. For instance, they marched back into the Middle Ages and tried to reinterpret several events and biographies in order to judge them as predecessors of Martin Luther. The way Lutheran historiography treated Jan Hus is a telling one, we heard it already. And finally, Lutheran historiography not only drew a line from the Middle Ages to Martin Luther, they also intended to save Luther's leg legacy by in in extending his influence way beyond his life. In times of confessional turmoil, this was highly appropriate. If we look at the first half of the 17th century, we will understand this right away. In the wake of the Thirty Years' War, Lutheran historiography needed to stoop to anything to keep up the Lutheran identity and to make sure that neither inner evangelical struggles nor challenges from outside endangers Luther's legacy and the Reformation as such. Let us give you an example for Lutheran historiography that did not spare anything. Now we see a pamphlet. The pamphlet, this pamphlet, which appeared on the Reformation's anniversary in the year 1617, tells the story of a dream that the Saxon elector Frederick is said to have had three times in the year 1517. According to this dream, a monk on the left-hand side, a monk who looked like the son of St. Paul, came to the elector and introduced himself as the messenger of God. This is a quote as a messenger of God. Saints then asked the elector to allow the monk to write something on the church door and Frederick in his dreams allowed this to happen. The pen the monk used, and I now want you to follow this pen, the pen the monk used was crucial. It pierced through Pope Leo's the 10th head, causing his tiara to shake. It even threatened to fall down, so the elector rushed to catch it, and then he woke up with his arms outstretched, only to fall asleep again immediately after that, and to dream that the Pope was now urging all the imperial states to fight against this specific monk. In the dream, however, the elector asked the monk why his, why his pen was so firm and stable. 
and the latter answered by referring to the Bohemian goose and thus to Jan Hus, who had been his schoolmaster. The spirit that had supported Jan Hus could not be driven out of this pen. When Elector Frederick awoke again, he decided to command the dream to God, knowing fully well that he had recognized the monk as a true messenger of God. And due to this, it can be assumed that Frederick would now do something to protect the monk while ensuring that this message, that his message was heard. Let us move on another level. The pamphlet is an expression of a Protestant culture of remembrance. Now the interpretation of the events of the Reformation was to be codified. The anniversary of the Reformation in the year 1617 was a good opportunity to do so. The culture of remembrance set up by this pamphlet focused very explicitly on Martin Luther and his continuous influence and legacy. Moreover, it had the task to present the Lutheran church as the stronghold of the true sanctifying faith, which was based on the work of a courageous and far-sighted reformer. In this respect, it was not surprising that, especially in the Lutheran sermons delivered during the three-day jubilee in 1670, the events of the Reformation were consistently and explicitly attributed to Luther's genius. As you can see, the line was drawn from 1517 to 1617, and it was Martin Luther and his teaching that had, had to make sure that this continuous line was not ripped apart. Now, coming from the narratives that were established to support confessional interest, it is quite easy to discover the same mechanisms and approaches in research, for instance, when the question is placed whether or not lines can be drawn dating back to the Middle Ages, crossing the Reformation era, and then leading into modern times. From a confessional point of view, 1517 will always be regarded as an epochal threshold. Despite the fact that Martin Luther's posting of his thesis cannot be proved, theologians and historians of the 19th and 20th century used to follow the lines of Leopold von Ranke, advocating the new epoch that started at the church door of Wittenberg. Today's research has revealed some of the narratives based on confessional interest, while either setting up a continuous line between Middle Ages and early modern period, or while strongly denying it. Moreover, church historians like Volker Lepin, who is now in Harvard, have suggested to leave the term of continuity behind and rather talk about a process of transformation. To speak of reformation as transformation goes beyond speaking of continuity or rupture, for this not only levels the epochal threshold around 1500, but it also deprives Martin Luther of his exclusive protagonist role, and that's a merit. Lepin tries to describe a systemic reform, which although it permanently changed the system, ultimately preserved the system. Here the attempt is made to grasp continuities and ruptures at the same time. In concrete terms, this means that the late Middle Ages and the time of the Reformation now appear as a period in which the entire system transformed into a completely new state. The identity, the structure, all patterns of regulation and decision-making have changed in an evolutionary way. And in the end, the vineyard was cultivated in completely different ways, but, and that's the point, it was still the vineyard. Such an approach requires first a new description and appreciation of the system in the late 15th century with its numerous facets. Secondly, however, the process of transformation also requires detailed investigation because many questions arise here. For instance, which elements have in fact proved to be sustainable, even if they have been altered by the reformation? 
you can see here the question of continuity arises on a different level. And the next question, what elements are generally binding um, it is they transcend the local and regional context that one can speak of a transformation that has affected the system as such. Questions to be solved. Now, we have come all the way from concise considerations concerning continuity and discontinuity. We had a look at the 16th and 17th century to gain insights into the narratives provided. We have also discovered the confessional and political interest which went along with the narratives. And the third aspect, very shortly, very briefly, will lead us to the political field again, getting back to the situation in Bavaria, adding another challenge to the narrative of continuity and Protestant identity. And I mean the heterogeneity of the Reformation movement and the different interests which derive from that. To address heterogeneity of the movement, we just need to take a look at various towns and territory in territories in which the Reformation emerged. There's a difference between the situation in Upper Germany, where theological thoughts from Zurich and Switzerland were adapted, and the situation in Saxony with its theological think tank at the University of Wittenberg. Moreover, the Reformation movement in Lower Germany took a different path due to the neighboring Netherlands and the specific rural areas. All in all, the almost 30, uh, 350 different territories within the Holy Roman Empire of Germination found their own ways of negotiating between imperial demands, their own self-understanding, and the actions taken by the people and by new preachers. All in all, we also discover an inner evangelical heterogeneity, which makes it almost impossible to talk about a coherent or even continuous Protestant identity. So now let's sum up. The desire to di discover a continuous movement within history is either due to its embeddedness into salvation history or the axiom of reason. Talking about a consistent salvation history, God is its beginning and end. If the axiom of reason is applied, one could easily draw the same conclusion that Johann Gustav Dreusen has found. In the end, history had a purpose and it should be the task of the historian to find the ultimate purpose of all purposes. However, in one breath, Dreusen also added that history is written by historians applying their specific conception of history and their personal question born under contemporary circumstances. Therefore, Dreusen states that history is the process that helps humankind to gain self-awareness and to understand rather than to explain. Coming from this perspective, the question of a continuous Protestant identity with tainted with a lot of challenges, which we are not talking about history of continuity or discontinuity, but rather here we are dealing with historiography establishing the narrative of continuity and discontinuity in order to satisfy specific interests. The examples taken from the Reformation era have shown what these specific interests actually were. Mostly theologians were fighting over the authorization and legacy of the Lutheran movement. Therefore, they designed the narrative of continuity while their Catholic counterparts emphasized the discontinuity instead and claimed to have the much longer and intense tradition. Finding these narratives in controversial debates suggests to stress their artificial character. In the end, the effort to create these narratives produced some strange effects as the pamphlet from 1617 had shown, which dealt with the dream of Frederick. But not only contemporaries took the bait of narratives, researchers during the 19th and 20th century have walked the same path. Their efforts to underline the discontinuity 
between Middle Ages and early modern period in order to put forward the specific character of the Reformation also shows an understanding of continuity, which is based on confessional interests. Finally, the narrative of continuity is also disclosed by the fact that the emergent Lutheran church and the Reformation movement as such were not homogeneous at all. In fact, an inner evangelical ecumenism was needed right from the start. Narratives shape identities. Since they address the common question and desire of the contemporaries, Therefore, the question of continuity is closely linked to the efforts to establish identity. We started with various aspects of Bavarian identity, suggesting that there is a continuity in white sausage and Oktoberfest. Now, we have to state that even this picture of Bavaria is a contemporary narrative that requires deconstruction. Analogously, we can assume for an uninterrupted Protestant identity in Bavaria that turns out to be an interest-driven narrative too, which does not deserve the attribution of continuity. Overall, the power of narratives shaping confessional identities shall not be underestimated, yet they need to be deconstructed. Thank you very much. We see some literature here and continue with questions for the discussions. Thank you very, very much. The questions I have uh, for the chat also, if uh, this picture disappear, <clears throat> I will put the question in the chat. And uh, also, I can tell you that uh, Mr. Quand and uh, Sister Grohovina will uh, uh, can offer you this PowerPoint presentation if you are interested in this uh, presentation. I think all of you are very interested to have this uh, PowerPoint. That would be nice. Okay. Um, we will have now the second session of discussion group. Very, thank you very much for this uh, uh, lecture. Also 15 minutes, please um, uh, think about uh, choosing, electing one person who will speak uh, after that uh, from the first uh, group also and group discussion and also from the second discussion session um, and now we can go to the group 15 minutes just i will write in the chat wow we are back a lot of us we have time to speak now in plenum from groups. It's not uh, um, necessary or uh, it will be necessary. Um, we have maximal 15 minutes to speak. Please start with uh, the group one. Yes, Selina. I think, yes, we, we were at group one. Please. Um, yes, from our first session, uh, we summarized that um, in ecumenical Christianity, um, the Christian Protestant principle comes first and uh, then later the form. But um, nevertheless, we need the Protestant church um, to have an identity and uh, to, yes, to have. Um, uh, identity in ecumenical uh, Christianity, so that there would not be the question in uh, this um, ecumenic, uh, ecumenical Christianity, uh, what is your identity? So you are Lutheran, uh, what does it mean? So uh, we need our identity to describe um, ourselves and um, yes, without form it is not um, possible. 
So this was the summary from session one and from session two uh, for this uh, yes narratives. Um, we were talking about that um, mostly when we describe our confession or our church, we say things that uh, we are not. So uh, we want to um, separate from others and we say like, uh, I'm Lutheran, so I'm not Catholic and I'm not uh, Orthodox. And we describe what we are not are, yes. And um, so we, we were talking about the different um, churches we are from. And yes, I, I think we, I don't have to tell all the details, but um, yes, I think uh, these are some impressions from our Thank you. Book. Yes, it's not absolutely necessary to speak all that we heard in the groups. Please, the next group. Thank you. So um, we were group two and to the first question, it sort of adds up to which or to which Selena already said, because we saw the same thing that um, knowing your own confessional identity and adapting to a current church situation are sort of two sides of the same medal. So reflecting on themselves is very important because in this sort of self-critique, you can see the different aspects of what defines your church and your confessional identity on one hand and on the other hand, you can always emphasize on what is needed in the current situation we are right now as a church or um, as a confession. And on the second and third question, we had, first of all, um, the confessional narratives are quite retrospective. So they are very important to define what is the church identity, which is especially important in terms of the narratives all around the Reformation, because in a historical perspective, you can see where are we coming from. But on the other hand, for the question, where are we going? It is quite important, or we saw especially the ecumenical movement as an example of, de or not deconstructing, but redirecting those narratives from drifting apart from each other to getting close together, not emphasizing on the differences, but on, um, the similarities. Yeah. Thank you very much. Someone from the next group, please. Okay. Uh, we had uh, two really hard sessions <laughs> in discussion because the first session, we all agreed to the question to the relevance of it and we nearly didn't find so we hardly found something to speak about because uh, we yes we were um, impressed by those two quotations and the way they were uh, um, presented um, and then we observed that we need some concretization to speak about and in the end we found that maybe the really uh, concrete and um, how you say, contemporary um, situation of online services. So to, to, um, to have church online, if that would be a form or a principle. So should we agree to it? Because it's, uh, yeah, from the, the communion is necessary and we, uh, there's a Christian principle who leads it or it's a form. So that's what we discussed about. And in the second session there, it was hard because we didn't agree. So we, it was hard to, to agree to the um, statements for us. We were not convinced yet that deconstruction is the, the really um, solution or if it's really necessary because we asked what what can we be without construction so if they really construct a lot uh, all what we can what will remain there isn't it also construction what remains 
maybe just until here because uh, it's hard to resume the rest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Someone else from the other group? Yeah, here from the fourth group. Um, yeah, the first session. Um, yeah, we talk about a lot about the principles uh, of the church and what that means. And we make the question how the form of the church can contribute to the principles. Um, we make this this question and we talk about um, what it what these principles uh, means and um, that these principles are in relation with our experiences of life uh, and with God and, and how we live these principles in our lives. And we say also that uh, it's important that the church um, it's important that the church it's be, be open to uh, the experiences of the, the people inside the church and mm, be innovative and that the church uh, um, must uh, now be always in, this, in the same form um, uh, and to create new spaces to to experiences. Uh, and about this second question, um, yeah, we we talk about uh, a lot about uh, the concept of uh, narrative, and yeah, I think that <laughs> in resume we say that um, narrative is not something bad. Um, and that narrative are important to to give sense to our life and yeah we talk about some examples in chile and in Aust austria with uh, the churches and protestant churches and yeah maybe <laughs> someone else from uh, of my group can say anything else uh, or it's okay. <laughs> Thank you. It's good. Okay. And uh, I think it's uh, one more group left. The fifth yeah. group. So um, group five. Um, so we would agree with um, Selina's um, group that like narratives are to describe what we are not, but they are also there to describe what we are. Like we noted some um, narratives like um, we are Lutheran. In my case, like it's in my church, I would say there's also kind of narrative that we are Bavarian and that's something different from the other Germans. And also like we agreed in the narrative in Protestant church in Germany, there is, we are modern and we are not like, like the Catholics, they're doing all things and we are modern. We are, we can speak to the people and with the purpose to, to be that people are, yeah, can, can have contact to church and are like have have it easier to come to church and like and now my idea is like coming through the discussions and the shared ideas is that maybe we have to write a new narrative that makes it possible to have like a common narrative like we are defining us as ecumenical christians but we could have in our, we could have different identities. So to have a narrative, which is not excluding like Christians, but to have, yeah, different contexts, but to have the same narrative. Thank you. Were all the groups? No, there was also a group six. So okay. I can't yeah. really tell you new things. So basically every, everyone already said something we told, talk about, talked about. Um, just examples for the, the difference between church form and church or Christian principle. Here in Transylvania, for example, there are a lot of Protestant churches where the form differs, but the principle is the same. So we understand this distinction. And someone said an example that 
uh, in Asia, there are also Christians who doesn't really identify with any church form or they are not sure about to which church they belong, but they follow the Christian principles. So we find this distinction important. And for the second question, we saw that sometimes the national narratives uh, work together with the church narratives and they could or they should be deconstructed sometimes. Also from, oh, for example, in Georgia, they assume if you are Georgian, you must be Orthodox, but here also in Transylvania, they say that if you are Romanian, you are probably Orthodox. If you are Hungarian, probably reformed or Catholic. And if you are German, then you must be Lutheran. And if we deconstruct this, then uh, we, we may see the smaller groups which doesn't fit in any of our stereotypes. But we also spoke, uh, spoke about uh, importance of the narratives and how a good role model can be inspiring for, for a minority church, for example. Thank you very much. I can assure you that in Transylvania, the deconstruction <laughs> has beginning. We have a Romanian pastor. She is Lutheran, but she's not German, but she's Lutheran. It's okay, so. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much. It was very, very good. You made it perfect. In less than 15 minutes, we have the discussion of six group. Now, um, I want to thank, but I want to give the, to the reference the last words, the last sentences uh, to Anton Tikomirov, uh, Rafael Kvant, and uh, Sister Nicole Grochovina. Please, um, um, and, and don't forget, I want, uh, after that, you say the last sentence to us, um, invite to Vienna and I will show you uh, the program and explain in very few words how do you uh, send your application until uh, 25 February. Please, uh, Anton Tikomirov. Uh, thank you very much. I would say one more time maybe uh, that our identity, our Lutheran or Protestant identity as far as I understand it, is the identity not of special form. Of course, we have a special form or our special forms, but our main identity is identity of struggle against the domination of form, of any form. So it's uh, my point of view, and I think it's very important for us. And I'm very happy that this question uh, is discussed in the groups and among us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. And from Bavaria. Then I will speak very shortly. So Sister Nicole um, will have the real last words. Um, because I would like to thank uh, for uh, the discussion in the groups especially because um, some points were brought up there which I find pretty interesting especially emphasizing the ecumenical aspect that was mentioned several times in the group um, uh, it, it fills my heart to hear this from next generation theologians because I think we're moving towards the future with this idea and um, this was a strong point also um, which was mentioned from, I don't know, group four or group five, but thank you very much for opening these ideas, which obviously were thought from the past, but you opened them to the future with these perspectives. So thank you very much also for the invitation and for everything around this conference. Yeah, I, I fully agree. Um, I especially like the ecumenical aspect as well, because I think that the time of um, severe exclusive confessional identities is over. Still, you need to be sure about your own identity. Um, but, um, you know, when you're looking at God's people, um, you can't do anything but being ecumenical. Everything else is um, well, we are a minority anyway in the world, so we better work together to put it in a very blank and frankly um, term. And second point I'd like to address in the end is um, to remind you, and you said it from your groups, you told it from your groups in some aspects, that narratives are not bad at all. No, they are not, because we are setting up identity by formulating or by living up to narratives. 
But if they become, as we said in our group, if the form, the narrative becomes the principle and sort of becomes a sacralized uh, narrative that exclude, like the confessional identity excludes others and doesn't you know, um, say it's, a, it's uh, adding up to a complementary way, then things are going downwards, downhill. And then you have to do the deconstruction. And you have, first thing is you have to be aware of the fact what is going on right now. So my intention was um, to sort of enforce the awareness um, for you because even ecumenical discourse, you need this awareness because you've got your own blind spots. Be, be sure about this, that an old lady tells you that you will have them and enjoy deconstructing these blind spots. Thank you very much, uh, Anton Tikomirov, Rafael Quant, and um, Sister Grohovina. It was a pleasure to hear and to uh, hear you and uh, discuss with other participants. It, um, there were hard discussions. Uh, there were, it was uh, online, but I can assure you with a great um, uh, message that we will be not uh, every time online just the next time uh, in two weeks we will be on the last lecture with the summary and an outlook but i like to inform you that the digital academy will be followed by a face-to-face -face conference in vienna wien beach in uh, 11 to 14 may this year. Uh, the results of the Digital Academy and the many suggestions will be discussed in depth there. The participants will present aspects of Protestantism between nationalism and cosmopolitanism from their respective countries and churches. You will you see now the program. We can uh, send it to you. Um, on the website, um, I will put in the chat. Um, okay, now you have it. Uh, in the chat on the website, uh, Young Theology, you will find the constantly updated status for the conference. Um, due to the funding of the project by Erasmus Plus, we are able to cover the travel costs and the main part of the conference costs and to reduce the own contribution to just 50 euros. There is a total of 20 places available for the conference in Vienna. Therefore, do not hesitate to take the chance to get into conversation with each other at this presentable event. Register for this special conference in the wonderful city of Vienna. Send your application with your name, date of birth, your church of origin, country, denomination, and the reason, reason for your motivation until 25 of February. Directly to Evangelischer Bund, you have the email address in the chat. And now, if uh, is all clear, and all quite almost satisfied with the discussions because uh, it is uh, very hard to discuss so big uh, questions and big issues in just two hours with three reference and uh, 21 uh, participants and one moderator from Romania. I thank you uh, for participating and I'm happy to see you next time in two weeks and in uh, Vienna. It would be very, very good. Danke. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. All the, best. All the best I wish. Thank you very much.